Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February edition of Post Perez. My name is W.H. Park, and uh, unfortunately, John Pollock will not be joining uh, me today on the show. He, he can't get uh, a babysitter to watch his uh, young son, Max, and uh, that's that takes precedence over anything. But fear not, you won't be listening to me for the next, oh, I don't know, 90 minutes or so. I do have a guest. Uh, we, we announced him earlier this week on, on the various shows John Way did. Uh, from the Eastern Lariat, we have my good friend, Dylan Fox. Dylan, how are you, sir? WH, I am so honored to be on Post Pro Res right now. And man, I was looking forward to talk to John Pollock, my, one of my idols in this podcasting game. He inspired me even when I was still, uh, first time I listened to those guys was over 10 years ago. And the first time I listened to you was a long time ago on your Super J Cup reviews uh, all the way back then. So even without John, Hopefully I can give your listeners something to be entertained by, some good stuff. Uh, we've done shows frequently on my show, The Eastern Lariat, or semi-frequently, and I think everybody really has enjoyed them. So hopefully your listeners can enjoy the this little piece of The Eastern Lariat I'm going to bring over to you guys as well. Definitely, definitely. But I'm sure a lot of the uh, the uh, post listeners are familiar with you as you've appeared twice on Cruel Summer and once on Thunderstruck, the two shows I've uh, done for post wrestling here. Uh, we got a lot of topics today, Dylan, and uh, yeah. you know we we should get right into it. So some of the the big news coming out uh, this past weekend is from uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. They just uh, wrapped up their big New Beginning tour with their with their first time doing the show from Osaka Joe Hall, uh, the New Beginning in Osaka, and overall, like I, I want to get your thoughts about this show like just not not go too deep into the into the the card itself but maybe like the maybe the top like uh i don't know four or five matches that were on this show what did you think overall about the the main matches uh you know wh when you look at this show you had the build up uh, earlier in the month with the other new beginning shows that that happened and there were some big matches on there on some of the earlier shows here, this was the main show of the New Beginning Tour, so I had pretty high expectations. And here's the thing about the main event, really. That is the biggest match on the show. Uh, I really feel like they were trying to do a more story-based ba- main event, which makes sense considering the competitors and maybe their physical uh, limitations. I just think the problem is uh, – all three of the last big matches, or all four really, were all flawed in their own different ways. You know, uh, when you look at the main event, I think early on the stalling was so heavy with Kenta and Naito. I understood what they were doing, and this whole feud has been built up really great and amazingly. I feel like with Kenta's heel work specifically, here you had a you know a good. 10, 15 minutes maybe of just literally just stalling for the crowd, doing heel work, and that added to the overall um, the overall time of the match itself. You had run-ins and stuff like that. If you listen to the Eastern Lariat, you know I'm not a big fan of that sort of thing, uh, the more sports entertainment style uh, of stuff. Though in this case, I will give you this. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, WH, or you felt the same way I did, but match highlight for sure had to be when Bushi ran in and immediately got taken out <laughs> to, to no avail. Uh, very, no, very funny. Because it was, it, he was taken out by someone I, I dislike more than Bushi, which is oh, Jay White. Oh, yeah, that's true. That is true. I, I'm with you on that one. See, so I know John is a fan of Jay White. I listen to your guys' shows uh, many times. So I, I'm, I'm a totally different style than Joe Poe on this one because I am completely with you. Uh, I, I think I might like Jay White even less than you. Because uh, you've you've had to try and rein me in sometimes on my, my dislike uh, of Jay White, but here uh, there was I just thought it was very funny to get see Bushi get taken out, but even better to see Hiromu take Jay White out. That I really enjoyed. That was good. But uh, yeah, the funny thing about this match is, is that this was a 35 minute match almost, and by the time it happened, you had all the stalling at the start where nothing happened. I don't think the match ever really picked up until after Naito got busted open. Uh, and they had this huge bloody mess that he had here. And the crazy thing is that they could have actually have stretched this out even more for more drama. You know, like I think as soon as he got busted open, it felt like that 
they just weren't prepared for it. They weren't ready for it, and they went pretty much right into the finishing stretch right away. Uh, pretty easy win for Naito. Not easy, but you know it was one Destino that got it. It wasn't some big drawn out sequence. Uh, he got it right away. Uh, I think if they had drawn things out a little bit more, I think that was the best part of the whole match to me, and uh, they just really ran away from it. And I guess you can understand because Naito is probably like, get, get me out of here with this uh, Muta scale uh, mask that he was re- wearing here. But overall, I think there was too much stalling in the main event, and that was my main issue uh, with it. Well, I mean, I knew things were going to go south as soon as I saw like you know Kenta coming out with the Bullet Club. And I was just like, oh, right. they get, they're going to recreate that that whole angle where like AJ did it. I think he did a title defense and he had like all the bullet club, like gallows, Anderson, Tamatanga fucking the young bucks or something. And then, you know, it's all, you know what? Cause that all builds up to like, you know, red shoes doing his bullshit. Get out of here, go to the back. And like, and they're pushing him around. It's just like, he says, he just comes across as such a wuss. Like he's just doing his bad (laughs) acting. And then just like, this is like, that the match hasn't even started, and I think this is bullshit already. And and it's all designed to get red shoes over. That's that's I firmly believe that. And such garbage. And then we get the stalling. And I like Kenta. And here's the thing: I agree with you. Like the whole idea that the build to this was incredible because Kenta has been doing such an amazing job with his promos, and he's one of the best promos in all of wrestling regardless of whether you're speaking English or Japanese. And Naito's done a good job of building it as well. But, like, really, kind of carried the brunt of promoting this match, I felt. And then, you know, he had all the stalling, and I'm not a fan of that. And then I do feel there were there were parts of the match that were you know, interspersed with, you know, good hard-hitting strikes, like the Kenta of old. And, like, once in a while, we see him peek through in his run into Japan. Uh, but it's, 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 you know, it's not that common. And I thought, I was hoping we would see a bit more of that here, but we didn't. And you, you know, you're right. It really picks up at the end when, when Naito gets busted open hard way. I think he was, his head was ramped into the, the exposed turnbuckle, right? So maybe a little bit too hard. And then like, it's just a crimson mask. I think he required like six stitches and eight staples, Something like that. Mm-hmm. Don't quote me on that, but akin to to that number of like uh, needing, you know, like stitches and, and staples to close up the wound. But uh, this match did not need to be thirty five fucking minutes. Okay, like why can't we have a fucking match that's like twenty minutes? It, this is a real problem for New Japan. I really think because a lot of these guys, I'm sorry, they can't sustain my interest for thirty five minutes. They really can't. Even like. You know, I'm not a, I'm not down on Okada so much as like it seems like a lot of people are. Like, I I think even he now is like really stretching it with doing anything beyond twenty, especially if it's not a title match like his match with with Taichi the week before. But I'm not a yeah. I I gave this match. I don't know. I can't remember what I gave it. I think it was like three. I think I gave it a gentleman's three just because like it was it was just too much for me. But. They tried hard. I, I have to give people credit for that. Let, let's move down to the the, yeah. the, the semi main, and uh, John Moxley took on Minoru Suzuki in a very very highly anticipated match. I know I know Way was really looking forward to this. I think it was his most like anticipated match during this tour. I myself, I will give my thoughts. I I thought it was okay, but again, too much brawling outside, too much like trying to be cute and and that's not what i was hoping for for this match i was hoping they just beat the shit out of each other and they didn't really do that dylan i don't know what you thought about that no i mean i completely agree with you actually like here's the thing when moxley came into new japan he had matches like against juice and that match versus ishii in the g1 i think was easily one of the best g1 matches last year uh came out of nowhere i mean it's ishii like who uh, only very rarely disappoints us, uh, and it's usually – it's pretty much never his fault if it happens. But still, Moxley totally delivered the great things, hard-hitting wrestling, different style. It was so, He came across so cool. And in this kind of match, to me, I think some people will like it anyway uh, just because these guys have such a fan base surrounding them. 
and a big aura surrounding them. They're going to like it no matter what they do. Uh, but to me, it's like a lot of the stuff they did here was like instead of the violence and the stuff that you were talking about, it was like their idea to get this match over was let's make these like really cartoony faces at each other to show I like what we're doing instead of like actually bringing the what he brought versus Ishii. So I wanted to see more of a match like that versus Suzuki. Uh, but here, it was a good match, I would say. Not bad. I liked it more than the main event, but it, it wasn't It wasn't what it could have been to me. That's kind of my overall feeling on this Moxley versus Suzuki. And I think Moxley, in general, I think he had a really hot start. He like you know blew away everyone's expectations. Uh, if you watch AEW, I know he's pushed there as a main eventer, uh, cutting, cutting great promos and things like that. But uh, he's really, the last few months in New Japan, I think he hasn't... Uh, successfully, re, you know, recreated what he was doing at the start in the G1, where he really surprised me and was one of the one of my favorite performers actually during that tournament. Uh, here, I never got that. Like I said, to me, this was much more of a cartoonish version of John Moxley than I wanted to see, as well as Suzuki as well, who you have to say is just as guilty as Moxley uh, of those things. I think the thing about Moxley is that you know, since the coming back to New Japan and like doing the challenge yeah. with, with Lance Archer for the U.S. title, is that he's wearing those pants. He's wearing the jeans, like his, his yeah. AEW look. And, and AEW John Moxley is good in AEW. I want to see Battle Arts John Moxley that we saw in the G1 Climax. You know what I mean, Dylan? Yeah, he, he, he wore a tire that looked strikingly like Takashi Sugira's. It was, it was not a Battle Arts worker. But that's who he reminded me of coming out. Uh, you, you, I completely agree with you. Give us the legit look, uh, the hard hitting style. Bring it back, like you know. And I think the problem is, uh, Umino's gone now, Shota. So I think he's lost his edge. I think Umino played much more of a role than we all wanted to admit in Moxley's run. And now that he's gone, Moxley needs to find himself uh, quick. Uh, I was also, I, I thought, I, I will say this. I like that he retained the title here because I think a lot of people were penciling in Suzuki uh, to get the title for a U.S. run because obviously uh, it's New Japan. So, of course, the titles don't make that much sense. Uh, and now we have a U.S. champion who can't defend the title in the, in the U.S. here. So, but uh, I actually did like that it was a little bit of a surprise finish here uh, for Moxley winning. Well, what do you think about Zach challenging for the U.S. title? And you would think that as we record this, is it's going to be uh... – you know, Osprey versus uh, ZSJ in your call for Rev Pro to for the uh, I call it the IWGP British Heavyweight Title, and no one can convince me otherwise. Yeah, WH, it's the Rev Pro British Heavyweight Title. Yeah, yeah, you can delude yourself. It's the IWGP British Heavyweight Title. Anyways, I do think that's going to change hands. I think Osprey's going to get that, which would free Zach to win the United States Title, and I I think they really need to get that belt on anyone who can defend it in the United States, who's not contracted to AW. I think it would be funnier, though, if Moxley kept the title for a long time to where he could not defend the title as the U.S. champion. Uh, so I, I root for my own entertainment value. But I, here's a question I have for you, WH. And uh, on my show, I posed this uh, once before. But I think you have a very interesting perspective as someone living in Japan. Um, do you think that New Japan, because... I think that this is totally unnecessary, but is how they think. Do you think that they're very, like, with the U.S. title, it has to be, like, a white guy that holds the title and not a Japanese performer? Because I think if you, they're very wary of that right now for the U.S. title to always be held by, if not an American, you know, a British person or, you know, Jay White or a Canadian or something like that, but never a Japanese person. Um. I never thought that. Yeah. Uh, it it just happens. That's how it, that's how that the lineage of that title is. I like I I totally thought Minoru Suzuki was going to win this title and like and then be sent to the United States because like it would make sense from a from like a financial point of view. Like the guy's super over in the United States and he would I think you know as the United States champion if he's defending that belt against you know various challengers you would boost a lot of these house shows that aren't doing that well. Let's be honest. Like this. You, yeah. you know, this U.S. expansion is kind of like dying in its own ass. Let's, you know, that's how Wait. I feel about it. And um, we can, I don't want to get too deep into that, to be honest with you. But I, I do yeah. think like, like, you know, having Zack Sabre Jr. hold the belt is a good idea um, because I do think, you know, there's, I, I, I can just imagine the hilarity of his promos saying, 
Well, darling, I'm the champ of the Brit fucking United States, this land of like Republicans. And I just see him going off on the Trump administration, which would be tremendous. Oh, yeah, that could be fun. But like I said, your idea for Suzuki, that's that's kind of my point. Like putting it on Suzuki made perfect sense. Like why didn't they do it? And that's the only thing I can, can come up with is like every champion has been a white guy so far. Like I really think that's how they think. I don't think it's a good idea. I think that's how certain people in New Japan think. And I don't know why because actually the American fans to me, as far as I see on the the you know, the western fan base, they actually like like you know the Japanese wrestlers better than the westerners. Like if you tune into New Japan, you like that's what you want to see. You want to see the New Japan style, not necessarily a sports entertainment style. I have always felt that way. Not not necessarily just you know white based on their skin color but also the americanized way that certain people wrestle i think they would much rather see a japanese style wrestler uh more so than and someone like suzuki can bring a little bit of both to the table so i was really surprised that he didn't win here as you zach uh that would be cool uh you know like you said that he cut some very funny promos but i think that ultimately this title does have to change hands and now they have another white guy that can win that can win the title that they seem to desperately want uh that's that just what that's just how it feels like to me. Like that, it's this title's been around for oh, like what two years now, and it's been all white guys. So I feel like there has to be some truth to this. This is like maybe a conspiracy theory well, on my part. Well, we'll we'll see within uh, by the end of the year if if it's only been Caucasian people holding this title, Dylan. Then then I will uh, allow you to have a victory lap on this show. How about that? Uh, well. You, you know, you never know. Like I said, I, I don't know if I want to be right on New Japan <laughs> booking sometimes, but maybe. Listen, the U.S. title is ready made for Goto if it, if, it, if it ever comes to that uh, right now in its current positioning. So you never know. You can't count. You can't count them out. WH. Let, let's move on to the IWGP yeah. Junior Heavyweight Title Match. Uh, champion Hiromu Takahashi taking on his longtime rival uh, Ryu, aka Dragon Lee. Um, I, I thought athletically this match was really good. Like these guys always kill themselves having a match with each other. Uh, psychologically, this match had none. This there was no psychology to any of this. the The only story being told in this match was, "Hey, we've wrestled each other a lot, and let's just kill each other. Let's just do multiple Canadian destroyers, and let's tease the uh, Phoenix Plex that broke your neck." And I was just like, "Yeah, I, I don't know. Like there are parts like the tope." Like where 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 yeah. like Dragon Lee, you know, put Hiromu on the on the barricade and then just torpedoed himself into him and sent him into the seventeenth row. That was good. And a lot of the spots were really good. But honestly, I really got desensitized by this match and I I just didn't care. And I like both guys. I think, you know, like some other people put it really well. I like these guys when they're wrestling other people. I'm I'm kind of tired of seeing them wrestle each other, Dylan. Yeah, see, again, we agree because like that was one of the points I made when Hiromu came back on my own show is that I hoped that they had held, you know, this match would be a thing that they really held off for a while because we've seen them wrestle so many times. I will say I think I like this match a little bit more than you, uh, to be honest. Uh, they did have a little bit of a story with Hiromu's uh, neck injury. Like Lee really went to that a lot. And they teased that a lot. Uh, like you said, the the match flow itself was very, very high paced. There really wasn't a lot of time to really move from one point A to point B. It was like move, 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 uh, kind of thing. Uh, they did have a little bit of intensity early on, which kind of separated their match, but eventually it all built into their match that they've had before many times. Uh, there's this, at least the same style. They had different moves and stuff now than they used to, but still. The pace of the match was the same. I could see where you were coming from. But on this show, like especially compared to the match that preceded it, uh, I thought this was actually a lot better uh, than a lot of the stuff that was on this show, to be honest. Uh, this was my favorite match on, on the show. Uh, but, you know, it, it was – I could see where you're coming from, though. And I, honestly, I feel the exact same way about you and that I hope that they focus on wrestling other people from now on because I think they're both very talented – and I love their rivalry. It's just we've seen a lot of the same style we've seen before. So that, that's just my feeling on it. I think we agree on that. But I, I like the match for what it was, uh, you know. And it was very impressive that they were able to fill the time how they did. I just wish that, you know, maybe, maybe this could have paid off into something a little bit more than they did uh, with the tease of the, the neck injury. I didn't want Hiromu to lose, but I think that they could have gone a little bit further with the neck stuff. 
Uh, like you said, it was more like just doing a lot of moves over and over. There's never any moment of drama, so to speak, where it's like he's going for this, you know, devastating move that could put Hiromu out. Like, will he do it? Uh, there was no storyline like that, really. It was just the moves spoke for themselves, kind of. So it was. A, I still thought it was a good match, though. Uh, I, I liked it for what it was, especially on this show. I, I, I thought it was a good match. It's just like I expected more. I think like maybe I'm a victim of my own expectations sometimes. I think this show is just a perfect example of that. I will say this, like the chop battle as, as much as I did enjoy that on some level to, to compare it to Kins- Kinsuke Sasaki versus Kenta Kobashi is just a, a really bad take in my opinion. And, and we we'll, we'll, won't go into that any more than what I just said there. Let's move on to a match. I absolutely fucking hated Jay White with ghetto taking on Sonata. Now, I'm going to safely say that I'm probably the high man here on Sonata. I like Sonata. I don't, I, but I understand why, like yourself, I know you're not a fan. I know, like, a lot of other people who I, whose opinion I respect don't like Sonata. And I get it. I think the problem with Sonata is, like, I think you illustrated this very well on your review of this show with, with Striga, was that there's a lot of sameness to Sonata. Like, he wrestles essentially the same way and he hasn't really done anything to kind of like freshen up his act. Jay White is basically 2018 Randy Orton who can't shut the fuck up. That's that's who Jay White is. Like he just wrestles like this like he wrestles like a really boring style. I I swear to god there's a point where he had him in a chin lock and I'm like it's Randy Orton. He's Randy Orton. But he's Randy Orton who doesn't shut up. At least Randy Orton doesn't fucking yammer on incessantly like a fucking dork and i and just drives me nuts like and you know what the thing with jay white here's the thing about jay white that people maybe you know don't want to talk, talk about is that jay white is there and he's in the position so ghetto can be on tv because i don't know a third of his match a third of any jay white match involves ghetto doing his interference bullshit this was the match that I most disappointed John isn't here for because I was looking forward to talking about this match with him uh, and seeing what we all thought about it. I, it, 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 you know, concluding our own conclusions together. But first of all, before we even get into the match, there's something we we definitely need to address about this. Two of by far the worst beards that has ever existed in wrestling, I would say, with, with Jay White Sonata, just a horrible. And especially for Sonata, his look was like his main drawing point for all these years, I feel like. And it felt like he went out of his way to go against it. So I don't know if he's like, this is like abstract, you know, a very very abstract version of fashion. Uh, He's a fashionable guy. I'll give him that. We've talked about this many times, you know, on his Instagram. But the wrestling itself, first of all, I completely agree with you about Gato and Jay White. That's really the main point of Jay White ultimately is that, you know, he exists for Gato to have, be on and have a meal ticket pretty much for airtime on his shows and big matches. Jay, here's the thing about him. Like we all saw his Young Lion run. And I think even people like us who maybe aren't necessarily a big fan of the Switchblade saw a lot in him back in those days. And thought, man, this guy could be a great worker. Maybe one day he'll turn babyface. But like in this match and like whenever I see him, I'm always looking like I want to, I want to like him. You know, this was like my guy when he was a young lion. I thought he had huge upside as a worker. I always want to like him more. But even when he wrestles, there's nothing to me about th- this match. Like even before Gato, even before uh, any kind of nonsense shenanigans, there was nothing special about this match at all. Like, and I, I've never really gotten that vibe from him in Jay White. So I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but I, I think we're looking for something that may. And that has yet to be there. I don't think we can judge him fully until obviously he gets away from this gimmick and because we don't know how much it is. But I'm afraid that, that they're breaking him because I think a lot of it is his own ideas about what makes good you know, heel work in Japan. And that stuff that you said, I don't know if it was his idea or it was told to him, but I hope that he doesn't think that that's the way to go. Uh, to me, even his promos, like he should be watching what Kent is doing. At his promo, like he is doing great heel work. Jay, to me, comes across very stereotypical uh, as as a villain and not all that interesting, to be honest with you. And Sonata, obviously, uh, your mileage may vary with him. Uh, but I will say this. My expectations for this match were dirt poor. Like these are two of my least favorite performers in New Japan right now. It never went off the rails quite as far as I thought it would. It wasn't a bad match. 
until the Gato stuff happened. Like that's when things kind of went, you know, went sideways. But the wrestling itself was, you know, solid and functional. Not great though. I, I don't think, you know, I'd be surprised if, if anyone thought their wrestling itself was, you know, uh, very special. But overall, I agree with your takes on Gato. Obviously, like we, you know, we're going to agree on Jay White. Sonata, I think it, he's an interesting guy and very over. Even though I'm not a fan of his, I will admit this. In Japan, he's got something that the fans love about him. Uh, they have something with him, and he has a special connection. And if I were booking New Japan, I would protect that per- personally and push him anyway, even if I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of his work uh, or his look or really anything about him right now. Uh, still, though, uh, he's got a connection to the fans, and he had some over stuff here. That Paradise Lock, as stupid as it was, uh, got a huge reaction. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, how the listeners feel about the Paradise Lock, but I'm not the biggest fan of that, obviously. Uh, still, though, the crowd loved it, and a lot of stuff they really love about him. Uh, Jay has a long way to go, in my opinion, but I think these two are who they are at this point until we see some drastic gimmick changes uh, between these two. But I will ask you one question about these two, but specifically Sonata here, okay? I want to run something by you, and we're kind of trailing back to the main event because there's something we didn't talk about. Do you think that this... Uh, if you remember the main event, as I said, Bushi ran out and Hiromu ran out. Do you think that it's a story that the heavyweights never come out to back Naito when he's in danger? Uh, you know, Sonata, Evil, and Shingo were not there for him. Um, yes and no. Like, I can see that being a possibility. But at the same time, I can just see it being like, Ghetto doesn't know what the fuck he's doing as far as, like, like the, the, <laughs> the details. Like, he sees the forest. He doesn't see the trees. That's the problem with Ghetto. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. He's a very big picture guy, and it's good. It's successful. It's worked. And he is largely responsible. Uh, like, part of it is, like, the backing of Road, yes. But it also is his creative of, like, the way he books the heavyweight scene. And to some extent, the intercontinental scene. Like, everything else is just kind of falls into his lap, I feel. Um, but, no, I can see it just being like, oh, just send Hiromu and Bushi out there. But it, it could be, like, that what you're saying. And I think it would probably be the best thing. For those three guys, like Shingo, Evil, and Sonata, to just turn on 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 Tetsuya Naito, like Evil and Shingo can be a new unit, and they should get like they should get Desperado to leave uh, Suzuki Gun and join them, and maybe one more guy create a four person unit. Sonata should just join like the regular army. He should just be aligned with like you know Tanahashi. I feel um, as far as his beard goes. Listen, Sonata's obviously been like doing a binge, and a marathon, a marathon binge of the Planet of the Apes movies, and he's like the biggest fan of Doctor Zayas. And if you don't know who the fuck I'm talking about, just go look up Doctor Zayas, Planet of the Apes, and you'll see Sonata is doing an homage to that guy. Jay White's beard is fine because he's supposed to be a, a hated heel, and nothing gets you know more heat with me at least, than a, a, a guy with a stupid looking like beard that looks like it, it, it just fell off like, I don't know, like, a, a, you know what it looks like? It looks like those brushes you use to clean like your electric shaver. You know what I'm talking about, Dylan? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's what he's got uh, on his face. That's what Jay White's got on his face is one of those like, uh, you know, electric shaver, shaving brushes. But, and, and it's fine because like, I, I, I don't like it. I, I, I don't like Jay White, so it's fine. And I want Jay White to be a baby face because I liked Young Lion Jay White. I liked, you know, Ring of Honor Jay White. I do not like the Switchblade because it's a square peg being shoved down into a round hole. That That is what this character is for him. And, and like, maybe in the, like, with the last two years, I've liked maybe two of his matches. And mainly because he got beat in them and mainly because the other guy carried him. So there you go. And also the crowd, I think that is one thing. Uh, like when he hits big with the crowd, he hits big. But there's also times that the crowd really doesn't respond to his act either uh, in Japan. So I think you have to take the good with the bad with him. Uh, you know, and the thing with Sonata uh, in the main event and all that with Lij, I think it's time, especially for Evil, to get out of this gimmick. Like it's such a geek like gimmick to me like evil i've never liked it and sonata like you said he could just be say sonata himself uh you know pretty much and i think they could try and re rebrand these guys uh 
I don't know if it means anything, but I just thought it was interesting and worth noting. Uh, that That's really all. But, yeah, the match with Sonata and Jay White, it wasn't the best. But it wasn't – like I said, it overachieved the expectations, but it wasn't anything I'd say rush out to go see. It was like, a, you know, a two-and-a-half, three-star level match, like kind of. Well, talk about exceeding expectations. I, I will tell you now, like just briefly talk about the match that I actually rated the highest on this show and the match that I loved the most on this particular show, and that was the – IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Title Match between Rapongi 3K, uh, cha- uh, challenged by Suzuki Gun, the team of El Desperado and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. I love this match, and I'll tell you why, Dylan. Like, what what made it different yeah. from other Rapongi 3K, you know, Desperado Kanemaru matches is that they really worked together. Both guys, both teams, really worked really well together as a team. It felt more like like I was watching an American style tag team match where there's a lot of you know, cool team maneuvers and they're they're And you know, the great thing about this match is that I love was like, they went to work on show's leg and that was the focus of their attack on him. And, and like, they're trying to isolate him. They're trying to keep yo out. And yo was really good at this match. I think it's one of the best performances I've seen from yo in, 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 in the last couple of years, um, like in a tag match. And I just thought Desperado Kanemaru was just like so good. They really felt like, you know, the Midnight Express or, or like the Andersons or, or Tully and Arn, like just, or the Heart Foundation, just isolating that one body part in the show and just working over. And he, he did a really good job of selling everything. And I love that the finish was a tag team combination move. It's not, it didn't devolve into like, oh, I don't know, two singles matches in one match. Like, like a lot of Japanese wrestling match, tag, matches are not not just new japan but like you see this in pretty much all of perez is like a lot of tag matches will devolve into like one guy's just trying to get the get his move on the other opponent and the other partner is holding the other partner outside of the ring you know what i mean that is not something like i want to see in every match but it wasn't in this match we actually saw a team move take out the other team and they retained their titles and then they had the challenge from Rocky and, and, uh, Taguchi. And I thought, that's, that's cool. I, I, I'm looking forward to that match. That'll be a fun match. And yeah, I, this is the match I actually love more than anything else on this show, Dylan. Yeah, it was a really good match. I, I think, you know, I wanted the best Desperado and Kanemaru match. And it's funny you mentioned that, uh, because those guys are fans of that style of wrestling, you know, the Southern tag wrestling of old. And I thought they brought that style here. You know, uh, Kanemaru especially is somebody that I have been far from the biggest fan of in his new, new Japan run. But here, I thought he did a great job here. Uh, Desperado, somebody that always seems to step up when you give him a big opportunity. And Sho and Yo... The thing is, like, because they've been stuck in this tag title division, uh, first of all, it's booked pretty poorly. Uh, you know, like, they never really get to have long reigns or anything like that. And just because there just aren't that many teams, I feel like they've kind of fallen by the wayside in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, show they still have something for, obviously, with his tease with Shingo. Uh, the other, you know, because remember, when these guys left, a lot of people really liked uh, Komatsu, actually, more than Sho. Uh, Yo, in this case, they liked him better than Sho. And when he came back, it's like show was, uh, you know, showing up a lot. I actually always like show better even, even back then. But we'll see what ha- happens with these two. The tag match, though, it looks really great. And I love the idea of Rocky and Taguchi teaming up just because it's something different. We've seen this same match with Desperado and Kanemaru many times. I think this was definitely one of the best versions of it, though. Uh, and all the matches we've seen they've had here, like you said, they had some good t- double team work here. They had the strong X that finished it uh, for, our, you know, Rapongi 3K. Uh, get some good stuff. Kanemaru even kicked out of the shock arrow. So, you know, it was a good match. Like, really strong stuff here. Not anything uh, crazy in terms of a storyline because it's just the junior tag titles. But I like that they're trying to do something different with these guys. And hopefully it carries over. I think Yo, especially, like you said, he looked really good here. When it comes time for the best of the Super Juniors, he's somebody that really needs to step up because he, you know, he's been kind of overshadowed by Show for the last year or two. Uh, if he can really get things in gear and just take that next step forward, I think that's best for both of them, and we'll see. Uh, and there'll be great additions to the Junior Heavyweight Title scene, uh, whether in tag team or singles. Like I, I really think that they can be guys that you can have up in the title mix. You know, main event, not main event of the show, but main event in terms of the Junior Heavyweight Division. Uh, you know, top tier of that. So. So I really like the match. I completely agree with you. Uh, one of the best on the show. And uh, everyone should watch it, I would say. Yeah, and uh, just as a quick note, I just want to say my favorite 
like matches overall on this new beginning tour uh, were the week before uh, February 2nd uh, in Sapporo, uh, night two of uh, the new beginning shows there. I loved the, the Rev Pro, sorry, IWGP, undisputed British heavyweight title match between Zack Sabre Jr. defending against Will Ospreay. I went full five stars on this. I Uh-oh. absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was like, it's my, my, probably my match of the year so far. Um, we'll see if it stays that way, but I, I love this match. Everything about it just like speaks to me as a wrestling fan. I love this match. Uh, the other match I really loved was the night before, uh, February 1st, uh, never open weight title. Shingen Takagi takes the title from Hiroki Goto and you made a good point. I, oh no, it was Striga maybe made the point that, you know what I would love to see? Hiroki Goto and Shigo Takagi forming a unit, maybe get evil. Evil becomes Watanabe. He drops the shit, the evil shit. That's like his Muda gimmick, right? Like when he needs to like bust it out, he can become evil in the future. But from now on, just be, be Watanabe. You know, maybe he, Goto takes him under his wing. He, he gives him a spare set of his pants and kick pads. They go to like the shrine together. They go to waterfall and pray to the, you know, the gods to like save evil's career. And, and they form this unit that just beats the shit out of people. I think that would be awesome, Dylan. Yeah, like I said, yeah, when he said that, I, I completely agreed with it. Uh, evil, I've been on that train for like years that, that that gimmick needs to go and is holding him back. And I think now the sad part is it almost feels like it's almost too late for him. Uh, even when he did stuff like the baseball spot and that used to get a reaction, and even against Ishii, it was like it was really kind of like flat when he did it. Uh, so he really needs to be rehabbed, I would say, going forward. Uh, Shingo, to me, that was the best match of the whole week. The, this, all this was Shingo and uh, Goto to me. Uh, but, you know, that, that was the match. I, if you're not familiar with me on Eastern Lariat, I call these matches soul food type of matches. I'm from Memphis, you know, so we have soul food a lot. And that's what this was to me. This was like the best version of some, you know, Memphis style slab of ribs, some dry rub, things like that. Uh, it's it's all good. When it, even when it's not the best version of their match, it's still good. And this was a very high quality version of their match, so it was really good. Uh, so I really liked the Shingo and, and um, Goto match. And as far as Osprey and Zach, I thought that overachieved my expectations too. Uh, you know, I, I really liked that match, and I'm not the biggest Osprey fan. He's somebody like sometimes I think he's like one of the best, you know, in the company, and then sometimes he he does some stuff that takes me out of his matches. Uh, but here, I thought they tried a different style of his match, too. And I thought, honestly, you got to give Osprey some credit here. Uh, they did much more of a Zack style of match. And Osprey totally hung in there with him and did a good job, I thought. And I thought it, I was really impressed with both of them in that match. Zack is really doing some good work lately. Um, I haven't always been the biggest fan of Zack in New Japan, per se. I know a lot of people really like him. And I love him outside of New Japan. I just feel like a lot of the times we... We don't get the best versions of him in New Japan, but when we've seen recently in some big matches uh, outside of the Dome, which, you know, it was what it was. It wasn't even that big of a match, you know, with the Rev Pro title. But, you know, he's been stepping up lately, and I've really enjoyed him, and I really like that match too. Those were, to, to me, those were the two best matches, Zach and Osprey and Goto and uh, Shingo to me. Okay, let's talk about, uh, before we pivot away from New Japan, let, we got to talk about some of the big news coming out of uh, these shows, like some of the big announcements. Uh, number one would be on August 22nd, which is a Saturday in uh, New York City. At Madison Square Garden, New Japan will be holding their own standalone show, nothing related to Ring of Honor. It's going to be Russell Dynasty, and it's it's been called, uh, it's been said that it's going to be a Russell Kingdom type event so that's that's top story coming out of this uh this weekend uh that we're talking about the other thing we should talk about are some of the dates that they've announced for the g1 climax so the g1 climax will begin in september on the 19th and 20th in osaka at edion arena and then on september 27th it will go to kobe world hall so i i assume in that you know seven day period they're gonna probably go to like maybe fukuoka which is you know closer to osaka than it is to tokyo i don't think they're gonna come back to tokyo they'll probably do something in the kansai region uh some shows some g1 shows and then they're gonna move to kobe world hall and then go back to edion arena uh on october 10th so you, you gotta think they're they're hanging out in the the southwest part of 
Japan around those islands, and then uh, they're gonna probably move to the final three nights. And I'm gonna try to go to the uh, at least two of those, uh, Dylan. I'm gonna try to go to uh, October 16th and 17th at Sumo Hall uh, for for the G1 uh, block finals. I don't know if I'm gonna watch the finals live. I might just go home for that. We'll see. But uh, that's big news. The uh, of course the other big news is that uh, you know World Pro Wrestling is gonna come back to uh, you know terrestrial TV on a good time slot. What would they call the golden time slot? Friday nights at 8 p.m. on uh, the satellite station BS Asahi. So we'll talk a bit about the difference between TV Asahi and uh, BS Asahi when we get to this story. But first of all, what are your thoughts about Russell Dynasty at Madison Square Gardens uh, in, on August 22nd, Dylan? Yeah, I think it's a good uh, replacement for them because obviously the Olympics will be in Japan uh, and that kind of moved G1 back. That's really the cause of the G1 moving back those couple of months. So now in its place, you have this American show that's going to happen in August in Madison Square Garden, uh, one of the biggest shows of the year for them and definitely the biggest one in America. You kind of mentioned it earlier, the you know the tours they're running in America – have not been the most successful. (laughs) I I think it's safe to say Uh, there was one in Nashville, which isn't even that far away from me. And it did really bad (laughs) in terms of attendance actually. Um, And, but, but well-deserved because the cards were not good either. Uh, So they, they think the thing with them is with this Madison Square Garden thing, we talked about this on my other show and it's like, my only hope for them is that they've learned lessons from their past because this isn't going to be like before. It has nothing to do with Ring of Honor. It's more so the fact that it was WrestleMania weekend that really helped them. Now it's like they are not going to have that sort of safety net with them. It's not going to be the first time. I hope that they've learned from the past when they did shows in California when Kenny Omega was champion. And everyone was saying, oh, you know, him and Ibushi – and all this stuff, it's going to draw for sure. And they never announced matches until, like, really the 11th hour. And it wasn't successful. At the end of it, Kenny Omega was cutting promos saying, man, it's, there's not that many people in here, but we all have fun. You know, you know, like, they need to learn from that stuff if they want to fill this Madison Square Garden again. They have to be very, um, you know, I think they need to announce matches ahead of time. Uh, I said it on the other show to me, as soon as Dominion ends, the main event would be announced the next day, like for, for that show, pretty much. Like I wouldn't even waste time. Tickets are on sale. If you buy this, this is like this is what you're gonna see. It's gonna be a great show, Wrestle Kingdom quality, blah, blah, blah. So to me, they need to get on top of that. And like I said, learn from their past mistakes because they made a lot of them in this US tour. So we have to note that this is the same night that NXT is going to have a takeover event in the city of Boston. And this is going to be SummerSlam weekend. So, like, not only are they contending with trying to fill Madison Square Garden on a, with a standalone talent based on their brand. And, you know, hopefully they're going to announce matches as early as May or June. Uh, I like your yeah. idea of doing it right after, you know, Dominion. The, the main event of Dominion should set up, like, the main event for Wrestle Dynasty. But... They, I mean, like, I, you know, like, I know they're not super close to each other, but, you know, if you're a traveling fan, you're going to either make a decision of going to see NXT TakeOver or you're going to go to Madison Square Garden. Like, myself, I am seriously contemplating traveling to New York City in August to go to this show because I want to see a show in Madison Square Garden. I've never been there, and I think this would be the perfect show to do that in. I, I know, like, you know, Davey Portman from Up Next, he and I have been talking privately. He was like, WH, I've got to go to Boston. I haven't been to Boston. I'm, like, it's not so much TakeOver is a draw. It's Boston for him. But still, there's a lot of people who are going to be gravitating to going to the TakeOver show because they're more familiar with that product, Dylan. Yeah, totally. Uh, You know, NXT fans are going to be in time for that. WWE always is going to get theirs uh, pretty much no matter what the timetable is. I don't really know all of the specifics, ins and outs, when it comes to the NXT drawing power that they've had on some of these TakeOver shows. I know they have one coming up uh, probably by the time this show airs uh, in Portland, and we're going to see how well that does. Uh, But they're going to get theirs. I expect them no matter what. And Boston and New York, yeah, that's not close enough to where you can try and pull anything funny about that. Uh, it's going to be competing shows at the same time, and 
the traveling fan base. It's going to be interesting. And I, I think even more so than that is uh, I think New Japan's U.S. expansion was really hurt when AEW really took off because that really cut into a lot of people's uh, budget, really. You know, that's the thing about wrestling fans. It's like it's not always about everything in a, com- in a country as big as America. It's like people aren't made out of money where they can go flying all around the country all the time. Like some people can do that, you know, a lot, but the, the, it's not 13,000 worth of people. As we saw with the Dallas show when they did that for the G1, that didn't, you know, that just wasn't very successful at all. Despite it being the first ever G1 show in America, and it should have been bigger, but for all kinds of reasons, it wasn't. So I hope, like I said, I hope they just learn from their past. And NXT, that's going to be a factor for sure. Oh, you know, uh, well, you know, like the WB is gonna load that show up. They're gonna, they're they're gonna try to destroy this show because you gotta think that Vince is gonna be like, who the pal, who the hell are these bozos running my building in, in MSG, right? <laughs> so like, you gotta think like they're gonna they're gonna just do like go heavy handed on like running the hot angles. Maybe they're gonna do like Gargano Champa again. All the NXT fans will wanna see that again. They're gonna do Matt Riddle. They, you know what? I can see them trying to put if they if they feel they need to, they're gonna do fucking Goldberg versus Matt Riddle on that show. That's what I think they'll try to <laughs> do. Like yeah, you're you're hearing it first. If that happens, people need to like say, WH, you called that shit. Just like you called Zack Sabre Jr. winning the New Japan Cup years ago. But what do you think about uh, the – what do you think would be the best main event New Japan could put on for this show? Well, first of all, there is one thing I need to bring up as well before we, we get into this, and that's how how dare you leave Japan during the Olympics. You are not going to support any countries there, you know, not, not even a single one, not Canada, not Japan, not Korea, not any of them. Like I said, and you're just going to leave. You're going to leave that easily. Very unhappy, very disappointed. But uh, it's okay because a lot of the Olympic stuff isn't that exciting uh, to, to watch, I would say. Uh, in terms of Madison Square Garden, in theory, anything's on the table if they mean it uh, about it being a Wrestle Kingdom level show. You know, you could, like I said, you could really do anything. And you're right. Uh, Madison Square Garden last year, uh, a Mexican company, a Lucha Libre company called AAA, tried to ru- to run Madison Square Garden, and WWE immediately counterprogrammed that, uh, pretty much like that same week, uh, to run shows there to make things worse. And AAA never even ran it. Eventually, they had to move to a smaller building, so they weren't even a threat to do anything. New Japan has a history of selling out this uh, arena once, but they showed that they could be a threat at least. And so, yeah, I fully expect NXT to do it. They're going to need a big main event. To me, it's going to be Naito as champion. I don't think he's going to lose the title by then. But if it were me, I would try and run uh, as big of a match as possible. Uh, I think anything's on the table. I think eventually, though, if I were to make a prediction on what I think they're going to do and what I would do, that's two different things. What I would do is have... Uh, Naito and Ibushi have their final blow-off match, which uh, didn't happen in the Wrestle Kingdom itself. And I think that would be a great main event for uh, people. And that's going to draw the fan base of America as well, because those guys are super over. Uh, LIJ, you get a little bit of a bump, Naito being in the main event. Uh, I would go with Naito and Ibushi. What I think they're going to do is... Switchblade getting the title shot against Naito because we've already seen his underling in Kenta get a title shot already this year and they have that storyline waiting in the background hopefully they blow it off before that time comes but th- those are the matches that kind of popped into my head you can go any different way though if you, if you want the one thing I would say is not on the table is Okada getting a title shot against Naito because I believe they're going to save that for next year's Wrestle Kingdom yeah so my idea is like, I can see the Ibushi idea but what I would do is like do a match that's been very, very well protected, and that's Hiroshi Tanahashi uh, against Tetsuya Naito. They rarely have singles matches, and this would be the first time in the United States, and it would be Hiroshi Tanahashi challenging for the IWGP, I guess the, the, the double title, both the IC belt and the heavyweight yeah. title. I can see that being a big draw because I think if there's one name that's really synonymous with a lot of Western fans, it's, it's Hiroshi Tanahashi. He's up there with Naito. He's up there with Okada. 
he's up there with Ibushi and and like I think you could tell a really really great good story with him I honestly don't think they're gonna go with Jay White like because I I don't think Jay White has proven himself to be a draw really in Japan uh or 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 in the United States like like I I I don't I can't off the top of my head I could be wrong like if someone points this out to me that's fine but like I don't think of I can't think of any show where he he drew like that you know enough people to say like he's a draw like we can he can carry a show this big on his shoulders I don't I don't think he's proven that I don't think they would entrust that to him I think he's he's cooled off a lot since the dome um so yeah i i'm gonna say tanahashi is is what i would do and i i really feel like i I really feel strongly that that is what they will do and that's what they should do i think definitely in japan you look at the numbers jay white has not uh not been exactly been a blasting success in main events uh in the past in japan but in america you have to remember too tanahashi and okada was a huge flop uh in g1 dallas as well uh I have no problem with Tanahashi. I actually would like that much better. Uh, I just think it's going to be up to how they promote this more than who's in the main event, uh, per se. Uh, Tanahashi, I love a lot. I think that match would be great. I love their series. And I, Naito, he's a real, another one of these hot and cold style of workers. I think at this point, he's been through a lot of damage. His body's been through a lot. But those matches with Tanahashi a couple of years ago, I thought were tremendous matches. Uh, so that's something the fans would love. And hopefully Tanahashi, like you said, him in Madison Square Garden, it does feel like he was like made for MSG in a lot of ways. That would be huge for him. So, uh, you know, I, I think if you think about it, he, that's something where he could say, like, look, the fans love me in America. Put me in the main event. This is where I belong. This is where Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle, some of my idols, they wrestled. Like, put me in there. I could do, you know, put it on my back. I could carry it one more time. And they could go for that. I could totally see that happening, actually. Um, you know, it would be great. I think they might try – If, the, like I said, if this is a true Wrestle Kingdom show, they may try and have multiple big matches. Uh, and with uh, Tanahashi and, ironically, Ibushi, uh, that's as we both predicted them – or wanted them, I guess – they're stuck in this tag title situation now, so they might try and say, well, we could have one big match for the title and also a big match for the tag titles and also this other big match with Okada. Uh, you know, you don't really know what their mindset is going in uh, with G- Gato, what he's thinking. You never really can tell with these things, but Tanahashi would be a great pick, though, if, if he did get the main event. Now, uh, a kind of side uh, story or, like, side idea that I had was... I think Bushi Road should bring Stardom over with them. Maybe run a Stardom show in a smaller building. Maybe I don't know the Manhattan Center. Maybe like uh, the Hammerstein Ballroom or something akin to that in the in the New York area. And, and then maybe have a dark match on the on the Russell Dynasty card itself. What what do you think about that idea? Because I, I really think it, it would be a good way to bolster the the weekend without you know, sacrificing like any of the new Japan talent in matches that you want to kind of keep them fresh for the Madison Square Garden show. Yeah. The, uh, the dark match wouldn't have to air either. So you wouldn't have to worry about any, uh, potential TV deal troubles or anything like that. Uh, so it it would be great. I think I, I, and I think the starter product is awesome. Like right now, I think they're actually even better than new Japan, uh, in general at the moment. They could have great shows in America. I think the the women of Stardom would be really motivated by coming to America for their own show, uh, get the, the booking behind them. Like you said, it would have to be a smaller building right now. But depending on how, again, that they promote it and what they do with it, I think that that could definitely be successful. And just the fact that they would do it would motivate the roster. And they're on a really hot streak. They're on a huge hot streak right now in Japan in terms of drawing success. I think this would just be the next step and really an obvious next step. I completely agree with you that they should do that. And there's no good reason, in my opinion, not not to do it, actually. Okay, and let's move on to the G1 Climax. It starts in September uh, and it runs through to the the middle of October. What do you think about this shift? Obviously, it's precipitated by... You know the, the the Olympics running in Tokyo in the, in the month of August, the traditional time frame of the G one. But uh, personally, I gotta say, I love it. Like I I hate going to G one shows in the summer. I hate doing anything in the summer because it's so fucking hot here, Dylan. You named a, a podcast series about about it practically. Exactly. Uh, how 
the summer is there. Yeah, all I know is I'm just disappointed that you won't be there for the Olympics. Uh, you know, but don't worry, I, I may not be in Japan, but I will be proudly supporting uh, uh, both China and United States, uh, both sides of me, and all of their Olympic uh, trials. Okay, I guess you could say. Let me just but, make one point here. The <clears throat> entire population of Canada lives in Tokyo, and then you're going to get all these really? people coming to uh, you know invade the city and the surrounding area to watch the Olympics. Dylan, I'm going to tell you right now, this Tokyo cannot handle that many fucking people. It, it has enough problems trying to you know, handle its existing population. The added addition of, I don't know how many thousands extra people who don't speak the language and, 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 and just going to put this massive strain on the infrastructure. You couldn't fucking pay me to go to Tokyo <laughs> in the month of August. You really couldn't. Like, seriously, this, this place is going to be a fucking mess. And I am more than willing to not only escape Tokyo itself, like not even go there, but to get out of the country would be a good idea as well. And, and maybe Dylan, you should think about heading to New York City and maybe we can meet up and watch some Wrestle Dynasty and maybe some stardom if they, if they have that show as well. Oh, I love that idea. Like I said, I, I'm hopeful that that could happen right there. Uh, all about it, all about New Japan. Although I've, I've dodged New Japan even in my home state thus far. So, so we'll see if, if I make the travel to a whole other part of the country to do it. But I would, just to meet you, though, WH, it would be worth it for sure. Uh, big matches. The G1 itself, like you said, I think it's great, actually. Uh, it cuts out all the nonsense because every year after G1, there's this huge lull because it's like, we know what the main event of Wrestle Kingdom is going to be. Let's get on with it. Like, yeah, pretty much like there, there's no drama in evil beating Okada for the title. I'm sorry. I can't get pro wrestling. I like, guess we know it's never going to happen. Uh, and it's just a big waste of everyone's time. Uh, financially successful for, for New Japan. I will give them that. Financially successful, yes. But from my fan perspective, it's time to cut the fat. Get for, from the New Japan. Be, and you're knocking on the door. Maybe World Tag League next. And then Wrestle Kingdom's right around the corner. So – very much approve of this change, and I hope they keep it even after the Olympics uh, leave. And hopefully, nothing bad happens with the infrastructure of Japan thanks to the Olympics. <laughs> All right, and finally, as far as New Japan goes, we're going to talk about World Pro Wrestling on uh, BSSIE uh, Friday nights at 8 p.m. The Golden Time Period, as it's called here in Japan. Um, this is prime time. This is really big news. I, I like so people should understand that. Uh, TV Asahi, which is like the kind of like it's one of the big four networks here in Japan. It's it's usually you know included and you just buy a TV, you plug it in, and you get like these terrestrial satellite, uh, like these terrestrial television uh, uh, stations. It's it's, it's kind of similar to the big four in America. What CBS, ABC, NBC, and Fox. So we have Fuji, uh, TV Asahi, uh, what is it, uh, Nippon TV, and um, we have. Uh, TBS, Tokyo Broadcasting System, and we have the NHK, which is kind of like, you know, like kind of like the BBC, the Japanese version of the BBC. It's, it's run by the government. It's owned by the government. So you have these other things called BS stations. So there's BS Fuji, there's BS uh, uh, NTV, and then there's BS Society. So BS Society is essentially what you would consider a cable channel. So this is the equivalent of, like I say, I guess the USA Network. This is the equivalent of uh, TNT. So not every home gets it, but most homes get it. And like the exposure for New Japan being on BSI on a Friday night at 8 p.m. is just massive because the the possibility of penetrating into a wider audience has just increased like a thousandfold, Dylan. Yeah, and wrestling historically has always gotten like uh, a bit of a bad rap. And I think a lot of people on the West are kind of surprised that New Japan didn't always have the spot already, like a spot similar to – I'm sure they figured that it's just like WWE just in Japan. But it's really not like that. They were in the graveyard shift 
for <laughs> all these years. And even when wrestling was even, you know, was in you know, near its peak. And the example I gave was when Noah was at its peak running the Tokyo Dome, um, they had a like it was a huge deal for them to get a prime time slot in 2005. Misawa Kobashi, first time in Noah. Uh, and it was like that was a huge thing to get out of the graveyard slot then. Um, and Kawada cut like a promo on Misawa and got everyone in trouble uh, the, at the end of that show. And that's why he wasn't there for like five years. But then you have New Japan now getting a, a golden slot on TV Asahi. Huge news. Like this could uh, – I said it on the other show. Like this could in theory set fire to the company all over again uh, and make things even bigger than they were already. Uh, great news for New Japan. Cannot be understated. And I think – you know, unless you have the knowledge of the Japanese TV systems, which many people don't, obviously, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just a, a whole different way of, you know, a whole different thing, pretty much. Uh, you can't really appreciate it as much, but for this company, this is absolutely fantastic, huge news for the, the wrestling fans in Japan. Okay, let's move on to All Japan Pro Wrestling and uh, some news coming out of there. They had a big show at Cork and Hall. They drew 1,687 people. Uh, it was broadcast on All Japan, AJPW.TV. It was headlined by Kento Mihara defending his Triple Crown title against his former tag team partner, the man who betrayed him, and a guy who's done an excellent job himself, kind of similar to Kenta, of promoting this match by like really stepping up as a character, and that is Yuma Aoyagi. And uh, I, I really liked... This match, I, I thought Yuma really kind of stepped up in, in the match itself. His in-ring was better. I But more importantly, I think his character, his persona, he really felt like, I belong here. I I can beat Kento Mirahara. I, he didn't feel like he was out of place in the match. And I like the, the new gear. He, he's gone to shorts. He wears like these long armbands, kind of like, I guess... I guess like you see like a lot of wrestlers and like and basketball players and just look just great. He changed the color of his hair. The only thing I would complain about is that he needs to change his music because that is not main event music. I am sorry, but I like the song overall, but it's not main event music. But I thought this match was really good. I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I I think Aoyagi is really well on his way to getting into that upper stratosphere. He's gonna he's trailing a little bit behind Nomura and Jake Lee. But I think he's definitely on the right path here coming out of this match. Aoyagi, I thought, was fantastic. Uh, not just in this match, but also the buildup like you talked about. And I think that played a big role in why this show did such a great number, despite it being just a February title defense for All Japan. And one that I don't think anybody thought Aoyagi was going to win the title. But still, it did a great number. He did great buildup character-wise. Now in the main event scene, I think it really came together for him. Uh, he did a great job throughout the match. And it really, uh, you know, came, he was able to exemplify in this match that this was the biggest match of his career, and he wrestled it like it in the match. And I really appreciated that. Uh, they did a big storyline with the spin kick uh, that he did here, and he finally hit it, uh, you know, pretty much. But in the end, he got the kick out, obviously, uh, kicked out of the Rockstar Buster. Uh, they gave Aoyagi a lot in this match and made him look like a, a billion dollars here. And I think he's going to have a, a great tournament. I hope they have some big plan for him. Uh, and hopefully it's not the end of his momentum. That's my problem with this match, actually, uh, when it was announced, was that, man, he had such a hot turn. Like, his turn was so strong. Like, how, that he when he suplexed Kento... And he came up with that look on his face. I was like, this is my guy. <laughs> like, you know, he, he was such a, a great heel that he had there. And here I was I was kind of sad that he had to lose so fast. But still, though, he made the most of it. And this was a really great performance by him. And it only did good things for him in the future. Kento goes on his way to continue his quest for Kawada's record. And that's really the prevailing story of All Japan right now. Yeah, he's going to be... Uh... You're trying to like he's 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 t he's at ten now. He's going for eleven. And he's going to face Suwama. Um, I I don't think he's losing that belt until after the Champions Carnival, which we'll we'll talk about because we're going to talk about the participants. They announced yeah. all the participants for that, but like I think it's safe to say he's probably going to beat Suwama and he's probably going to go into the Champions Carnival as the champion. And coming out of it, I think we're going to see 
maybe the person who's going to finally take the belt off of him. Uh, let's move on to the rest of the show. We're not going to talk about all the matches, just the big, the big kind of notable matches. Uh, all Japan World Tag Team title match, the Violent Giant, Violent Giant, sorry, Shuji Ishikawa and Suama taking on, uh, Lucas Steele from the UK and his tag team partner, uh, Shike, Shike Hiro Irie. And this is okay. Too much interference in my, in my opinion. I just wanted like two, these two, these four guys just beating the shit out of each other. You got a little bit of that. And I like the, the closing stretch, but all the stuff in the middle with like Purple Haze, the, 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 you know, the, the heel group that they're part of interfering, just it, it, you said it really well on your review of the show on Eastern Lariat. It, it was like the, what was it? The dark, uh, who are they called? The, the dark, dark mm-hmm. agents? Dark Kingdom. The Dark Kingdom. That was like with Kenzo, right? And the yeah, and the, the Dark Agents are yeah, and the, uh, the and the guys from the and the Lucha dudes that were in that group. That was shit. They were terrible. Uh, it's it's as bad as the Voodoo Murders, which which was shit as well. I would think that this is an aberration. That maybe I don't think this any of that stuff got over. So it's okay on on the undercard, Dylan. But you, you shouldn't have this in title matches, especially when. You, the fans want to see Ishikawa and Suwama like have a hard hitting match, and especially if they can unleash their their grumpy inner grumpy old man on two younger guys, that's even better. Yeah, you know this purple haze stuff just isn't doing it for me. Uh, I didn't hear. I, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. And they've been doing this for a long time now in all Japan, all ever since the days of the Voodoo Murders and Taru in All Japan. I know you remember them, and they did it again with Dark Kingdom and Kenzo. It wasn't the greatest. Uh, even Masahiro Chono joined that group at one point. This is, um, you know, waist deep into the uh, Shiraishi era of All Japan. Uh, I remember when Kento first came to All Japan, they actually recruited him to be in Dark Kingdom. Uh, that was a storyline, but uh, unfortunately, he never found his way there. And this Purple Haze stuff, it just... That's not for me at all. I didn't like it. And hopefully they get far away. And these guys don't even make any sense in this group because they started out with, like, you know, Izanagi and Zeus and, and these guys. But where does Irie and Lucas Steele fit into this uh, gods gimmick that they, they have going on with Purple Haze? And why are, why are they doing this? I, I don't well, like anything well, about well, it. Well, listen, let, if you, give me a chance. I'm going to explain where they fit in as gods. Irie is the god of eating, all right? He's, he's a food god. Obviously. All right. Lucas Steele is obviously the god of mullets. You know? <laughs> is that a thing? I need to is that a Japanese thing? No, like, w- why would it be a Japanese thing? He's he's from the UK. He's a white dude from the UK. It's a British thing. Obviously, he's channeling the you know, the hair of one Mike Awesome, the late great gladiator. So like yeah, this he's... guy looks like a younger version of Mike Awesome, don't you think? Oh yeah, I, I'm a fan of him. Like I, I like Irie too. I like all these guys actually. Like in the group, just not the presentation and what it, it signifies. Because Steel, uh, another example of a hidden gem for all Japan. But you're totally right. Looks just like Gladiator, Mike, Mike Awesome here. Uh, and hopefully he can have a chance to show that in the Champion Carnival that he can wrestle like him too, and uh, you know be somebody that they can build around for a while. But just this match. The purple haze stuff has got to go. Like I said, I'm, I'm not a fan. Uh, I, I don't mind it as much as you do. We'll see. Hopefully, they 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 pivot away from interference and more to being just like you know assholes in their matches instead of like cheat, cheaters. You know what I mean? Uh, let's move on. Uh, All Japan uh, World Junior Heavyweight Title match. My favorite match of this show. And the great thing about this match it was so good, but it was also less than 15 minutes. It went 11 minutes and 32 seconds. It was Susumu Yokosuka from Dragon Gate. He's the current. A PWF World Junior Heavyweight Champion. He defeated Akira Francesco from Italy. And this young guy, you know, Akira, he's really good. Like, I, I wasn't too sure about him when he first debuted, but slowly but surely, he's won me over. He's, he's got so much potential. Like, like, the, I, he gets wrestling. I really feel that. Like, he, he learns something, he perfects it, and then he uses it really well in his matches. And Susumu Yokozuka is one of the best bases for someone of Akira's style. He's really good at working with younger wrestlers and kind of like pushing them, pushing them to like kind of achieve, uh, you know, their potential. He's, he's, he's done it for years in Dragon Gate. And if you're not really familiar with Susumu, 
go out watch his stuff in Dragon Gate. He is one of the best wrestlers in that company in the in it, since he debuted in part of uh, M2K. And I love this match. Uh, is is probably my favorite match on this show, Dylan. Yeah, I like this better than the main event too. Actually, uh, like I said, I, I completely agree with you. Susumu has just been awesome this year, like in Dragon Gate or All Japan. Uh, he's really uh, been motivated. And when he won the title, uh, I, I had mixed feelings on it because I was like, man, Sato should win this for Aoki. I'm a huge fan of, of Sato anyway, but I love that match. But then it's like Susumu is like such an awesome worker that it's like, man, you get all these fresh matchups, so it's still cool anyway. And now you have this match with Akira. Completely agree with you again about Akira. I think that this guy, it's amazing that they even found him. This guy comes to, from Italy, a place where wrestling – is very very low on the to- on the totem pole. I don't know how he got so good at this, or, or who who taught him what where he learned what happened. But th- like you said, he really understands it. And the best part of him in all Japan, I think he's a perfect fit for this company because he brings something different to the table. Like none of the other juniors wrestle like him. He does a great job at it. I think he's a phenomenal performer at, at, for his age and his experience level. And Susumu, to me, if you ask me who's in my wrestler of the year running, like in-ring wrestling of the year, uh, Susumu would have to be up there. He, he'd have to be a top 10 candidate for me right now. Between the Sato match and this, I thought this was the perfect first title defense for Susumu. I uh, did a great job. Perfect time. You know, 11 minutes, 11 and a half minutes was great. Uh, he took Akira out with the Jumbo no Kachis. Uh Hit him with a Yokosuka cutter. It was awesome. Great, great match here. Really loved it. And finally, uh, the the last match that I would recommend people to watch is for the All Asia Tag Team Title match. Uh, it, it featured Jin, the, the new unit consisting of Jake Lee and uh, Koji Iwamoto, along with Naoya Nomura, Ayato Yoshida, and Fuminori Abe. But here we have Lee and Iwamoto. They're the the, the, the long reigning. All Asia Tag Team uh, Champions, and they took on the team of uh, Black Menzere and Takao Mori, and I love this match. I thought it was just a really great showcase of Iwamoto and Lee's t- uh, teamwork and how like good they work together as a tag team. And like, listen, and Menzere and Omori are a fun tag team. This match was less than ten minutes, and that's perfect because you don't need more than ten minutes to beat Black Menzere and Takao Mori. And I say that as someone who likes. Black Men's Ray. I generally hate Yohei Nakajima, but him as Black Men's Ray, I quite enjoy. And him teaming with Takao Mori is is really interesting because they have this like really bizarre chemistry that really, 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 really works well for them, Dylan. First of all, I have to give big shouts out to Jake Lee and Iwamoto for this Jin group, clearly shouting out uh, MC Jin, the best battle rapper ever. Uh, so I will give them that. Uh, as far as Omori and Mensare go, uh, obviously I was wearing my Omori shirt that, that I have here, uh, my, his Get Wild shirt that I have, and supporting him strongly. But unfortunately, no, Jin got the win here. Uh, and Iwamoto looked really good here. Uh, they really made sure to put him over. Uh, he actually got the pin with the Koko no Gejutsu. And Mensare, like you said, Yohei, I think I liked him. I, I didn't hate him uh, other than some of his attire choices that he had in, in the past. He's wearing his uh, gear included a garter belt. Like, I, nothing against people yeah. wearing garter belts, uh, like dudes, women, whatever. It just looked terrible on this guy because he, he does not have a good physique. If you would think for, no. for like someone to wear a garter belt that they have a good physique, he just looked like, like, uh, like a middle-aged dude wearing a guard of belt for his wrestling gear. It was like fucking terrible. He tried to be unique and I, I give him credit for that, but it, it never got over unfortunately. And now he's in with this new gimmick and I think much, uh, well, not much more successful here. He's probably really kind of the same position, but still a uh, good match here. I liked it too. Uh, they actually built up some near falls here pretty effectively. I thought, so I, I like that. Omori, I thought was really good here. This match really over delivered on expectations, I think. And it showed how good of a team Iwamoto and Lee are. Yeah. And one thing that I came out of this show, the a feeling that I got, uh, Dylan, was that, you know, I really feel there's like this youth movement happening in all Japan. And I think it's really exemplified by the, the announcements they made for the Champions Carnival. So let, let's talk about who's going to be in this year's Champions Carnival. Uh, let's go in the order they were announced. So we have Kento Miyahara, Yuma Aoyagi, Suwama, Shuji Ishikawa, Zeus, Jake Lee, 
Yoshitatsu, uh, Naoya Nomura, who's a big question mark because he does have this uh, spine injury, a neck injury, uh, that hopefully he's going to be recovered, fully recovered from by the time the Champion Carnival starts, but we'll see. Uh, Ryoji Sai, the returning Kai, and then we get all these new names, essentially, and we have Ayoto Yoshida from 2AW, who used to be a young lion in New Japan Pro Wrestling when uh, he was in the Kai Tai Dojo, and Taka Michinoku uh, was associated with New Japan, but then he cheated on his wife, had a scandal, and Yoshida kind of left New Japan because of that, and now he's in All Japan, which I think is a better fit for him. We also have from Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Hideyoshi Kamitani, who I like. I like a lot. He's he needs to get a haircut though. Like he, that bowl on his fucking head is just is just just so boring. He needs to get like a mohawk or something like that. But I'm I'm really excited about Kamatani being in this. Uh, the aforementioned Shigehiro Irie, uh, who's a freelancer. Uh, oh, sorry. Here's not a new name. He, in fact, he's the worst name in this fucking lineup. Johnny Valletta. Why the fuck is he in this? Like you can't find someone better than like you know what? I I would rather. They took Johnny Valletta out and brought fucking Sam Adonis back. Yeah, Sam, Sam Adonis wasn't that bad last year, but here's the problem. Sam Adonis doesn't look like Bruiser Brody, WH, and that's why he's well, in this tournament. guess what? Neither does fucking Johnny Valletta, you know? And, I, and Sam Adonis was perfectly <laughs> serviceable. He didn't stand or anything. He's perfectly serviceable. At least he doesn't try to do his bull, like some bullshit character. Like that was my big worry about him last year. He didn't do any of that. He tried to be a wrestler. He, like he did, you know, the sexy boy thing. That was okay. That wasn't as obnoxious as this fucking goofball f- swinging his chain and just cheating and inexplicably getting fucking wins over Kento Miyahara. I, that I do not understand, Dylan. But anyways, we'll get back to fucking Valletta. Next after him is the returning Joel Redman, who is a good addition, a good return. He, he's a very good wrestler. I think he fits really well with All Japan Pro Wrestling, and I want to see more of this guy in the company. Uh, Lucas Steele, uh, Davey Boy Smith Jr., who's got to be the biggest foreign name in this uh, tournament, uh, making his All Japan debut. And the biggest name, and the name I think is is going to really like, t- take go to really far in this tournament, and that's Pro Wrestling Noah's national champion, Takashi Sugiura, Dylan. What do you think overall about this lineup, and what, like, I don't know, two or three names really stand out for you? Yeah, big improvement over last year, to be honest. Uh, A lot of the guys uh, that are in here are big steps up. I mean, I like Sam Adonis uh, decently enough. He wasn't some terrible performer, uh, but he, you know... A lot of that block he was in was really underwhelming, but still he was better than like Daichi, uh, Cyber Kong. Like those guys had to go, and th- thankfully they did. Uh, now you got guys like Kai, who is a welcome return, uh, has historically had really big runs in Champion Carnival. Davy Boy Smith Jr., uh, somebody that this is going to be a big opportunity for him to wrestle i think what his preferred style of wrestling will be i think he's going to get that opportunity here that he never really got in new japan that uh you know i know he probably always wanted and then you have obviously uh takashi sugira coming in that guy he he was my pick for the best wrestler in ring of the decade in the 2010s and so i'm a huge fan of him and i think he's a great performer even now uh, you know, his age is up there, yes, but he doesn't show it at all. He wrestles just as great as he always has, and I think he's going to have a fantastic tournament, uh, no matter who he's in with in his block. And he's going to be somebody – out of all the guys, these new guys, uh, none of them really have a chance to win the tournament or go to the finals, really. But he does. He's the only one that does. So uh, he's somebody that I really have my eye on in the whole tournament. Well, I mean, it goes to my point about, like, there's this, like, youth movement happening in, in all Japan. Like, you know, outside of, like, really Suwama Ishikawa, you don't really have the, too many of these people that are, like, that, like that old like yeah zeus is is getting up there but he's he's still i think in, in kind of his prime age and ryoji sai is yeah he's 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 there he's not special but like he's not he's not like you know hitting the twilight of his career necessarily as far as his age goes but i look at like you know yuma i look at jake lee nomura i look at uh, yoshida kamitani irie and lucas Steele and dave boy smith jr who's still relatively young as well like this is Really, if you can keep these guys healthy, you can keep these guys coming in for regular tours. I really think All Japan 
has a shot to really improve their box office and and really have some really great you know booking in their matches and storylines going forward like where a lot of these guys are going to interact with each other Dylan yeah I I think you know I think it's great Yoshida is somebody that I, I really happy is in the tournament uh wins and losses for him are secondary he could lose every match and still gain something for this tournament I feel like and his matches are always going to be really strong, as we saw with the Nomura match last month. Uh, Kamatani is somebody I'm always interested in seeing because when he came along, like his, you know, his first time in Big Japan four or five years ago, I thought he had all the potential in the world to be a great performer, like top guy in the company. He won the title in an amazing match versus uh, Yuji Okabayashi, who was in last year's tournament. Uh, and he, it looked like he was going to be special. They kind of really botched his title reign really bad. Uh, not really his fault, but it's more so bad booking. And then he was in the doldrums for all these years, teaming with Daichi Hashimoto. It's not a good look. But he had a lot of potential at one point, and I'm hopeful that he can really tap into that here. You have the young guys at All Japan, and it's great. They they formulated something where they have these guys, Lee, Nomura, uh, Aoyagi. The thing is, though, in the tournament – the timing of it is if you were going to put at any kind of issue point at any kind of issue is that Lee and Aoyagi have already had title shots this year. Uh, so that really puts the main spotlight on Nomura. And unfortunately he has his injury. So I feel like Nomura is the one, the fact that they announced them tells me that they really want him to win this tournament. Uh, I would say, uh, but hopefully he can go is all, is all I can say on that end. And we can continue the youth movement because he would be the perfect person to challenge uh, Kento after the champion carnival. Well, I think the perfect person is someone who's never held the triple crown and that, or challenged Kento Miyahara. And that would be Takashi Sugiera. And I honestly think like, like Noah's not going to lend him out for this tournament because he's what he's, you know, he's kind of their flagship guy, right? you know, like of, of the original Noah guys more than Marafuji is these days. Um, I think he's going to win the champions carnival. I think he's also going to possibly win the, the triple crown for Kento Mihara. And I think that would be a great way for like, personally, I think Nomura should beat someone else. Like I always thought that Nomura should beat someone from big Japan, either Daisuke Sakamoto or Yuji Okabayashi one of those guys should have beat Kento for the belt, have like a six month reign with that belt, just beating everyone else. And then the guy, the savior of the company of getting that title back would be Nomura. And now you don't have Okabayashi or Sekimoto doing that. You have Sugiera do that. And I think it would be, I think it would really raise all Japan's like box office. If you had him, of course, he's still going to you know do a lot of you know matches for, for Noah, but He's going to raise the profile of that belt, especially with something we're going to talk about later. Noah being bought out by by Cyber Agent, the the owners of DDT. Um, I think Noah's going to have a higher profile this coming year. And if Sugiera is a champion, uh, carrying the Triple Crown on those shows and defending it on those shows as well as in All Japan, I think it's a win win situation. Um, one one point before I hand it over to you and, and we move on is that like. You know who they should have got instead of Johnny Valletta? They should have got another Japanese guy, Dylan. They should have got from Big Japan Pro Wrestling. They should have got Kawakami, Ryuichi Kawakami. That guy would have killed it in this tournament. Yeah, he would have been good. Like I said, uh, I like Kawakami a lot. Uh, you know, he would have been great. Valletta, I don't know what it is. Like, like I said, they just want a Bruiser Brody clone. Like that's really it's all that's all that this is about. And I don't even take him seriously. He's like. An unfortunately necessary evil at, at this point in the tournament. So I don't like his matches. He's not a great wrestler, obviously, but he will have his role in the tournament, I guess, similar to a Yano in a G1, I guess, if you're not familiar with All Japan. Uh, just a guy that cheats a lot. Maybe he can take some DQ losses. And he'll inexplic- inexplicably beat somebody that he shouldn't, uh, much like Yano in G1 as well. Uh, so we have that to look forward to. But yeah, yeah, you know, your idea with Sugira. First of all, I, I told you this uh, privately. Anything that ends with Sugira as world champion is a great idea. Like, like under under any circumstances, you've automatically come up with a winner. But 
to see him hold that title in Noah, I think would be awesome. Like, I think that would be great for both sides. Like you said, I think all Japan would gain something from it. I think that would tighten the bonds between the two companies, uh, two companies 20 years after the initial split. Uh, I'm always a big fan of them working together more. And, you know, I think the only issue is that they put so much stock in this next stream thing that they really want like Kento to be the face, like the focal point of it. But like I said, to me, there's one thing that's for sure. Sugiro's not losing a lot of matches <laughs> in this tournament. No matter who's in his block, he's not going to be lent out to just goof around. I think he'll. I think they want Nomura to win, and he, but he'll make the finals. And if Nomura can't do it, then Sugiro, I think, is definitely going to win. And even in the block play, I'd be surprised if he loses. I'd say one match, maybe two. But I would say one match is even more likely. I think he's not going to lose a lot. And they, ha- they have plans for him. And hopefully Noah and All Japan can work together continuously from here on out. Yeah, I mean, like, one of those losses should set up uh, All Japan guy challenging him for the the national title, if he's still holding it by that point. Uh, We'll see. Um, One thing we should talk about before we move on to another tournament that we're going to talk about is the the exclusion of two prominent names from last year's tournament, um, Joe Doring and uh dylan james and uh as far as dylan james goes like um there's a lot of rumors out there i'm not going to speak on them i've been told why he's not been in all japan recently and why he's not in this uh from what i can gather from what i was told i think he's done with the company um there was an incident i'm not going to talk about what that incident was but it's serious enough where like you know all japan might not be interested in using him in the near future and maybe even down the line when maybe things clear up, if they ever clear up, we'll see. Um, as far as Joe Doring goes, uh, people should be aware that there's been kind of a regime change in the creative department of All Japan. Uh, Jun Akiyama, the president of All Japan, is no longer the, the booker. He, he's no longer the, the head of, you know, so-called head of creative. That that job is now uh, going to uh, Shuji Ishikawa. And from what I was told by someone close to Joe Doring was that uh, Shuji Ishikawa is not uh, a big fan of Joe Doring in the sense of like he doesn't really see too much in him because of injuries, because of his age. And I think he's kind of, uh, you know, not a casualty or a victim. It's just he's collateral of this kind of movement to kind of going with younger wrestlers and trying to create new younger stars who can carry the company, uh, you know, into the next five, 10 years. And I don't think it's, you know, I like Joe Doring and, and it's nothing against Joe Doring, but I think his time was, was done in all Japan, especially considering he's been, he, he's very injury prone recently. Um, but yeah, I hope like he lands somewhere really well and he's, he's, he's does well, but maybe it's not really, you know, time for, it's not his time to be in all Japan anymore, Dylan. I was a big fan of Joe Doring's uh, when he was the Triple Crown champion uh, the last go around. I- I'll go to my grave. Like, this is what I'm going to remember. Like, you know, hopefully a long time from now, 60, 70, 80 years from now. Uh, on my deathbed, I'm going to be thinking Doring should never have lost the title uh, as early as he did. He, he should have had a longer reign with it. Uh, and unfortunately that didn't happen. And ever since then, he's been in limbo. And like you mentioned, I really, the main thing with him is he's had a lot of injuries, uh, over the past couple of years. And even last year in the, in the tournament, he really let, uh, I don't want to say let us down because he was just, uh, the heart was there, but the body wasn't willing. You know what I'm saying? Like he was just too hurt. He wasn't performing at a high level last year. And, you know, like I said, I think losing him, uh, opens the door for somebody like a Yoshida, uh, and that would really help them out. And you could do more with guys like that. Uh, no, no offense to Joe, he was a great champion when he was in. I loved him as a performer. You know, everyone loves you know, come on, motherfucker, show me power. I love that. Like that was my stuff. Wh, when that happened. Remember, I remember when he beat Kai, and after his interview, he said, "Where's my beer?" I, he was awesome, great champion. But unfortunately, it wasn't to last, and. Now he's out of the tournament, but, you know, he'll be missed. Uh, Dylan James, just weird stuff seems to follow that guy around. Uh, even in Zero One, he had, like, a really weird uh, exit from the company. So you, you never know what you're going to get uh, with these foreigners. You never know what you're going to get uh, J- Japanese dealings. So, uh, you know, uh, he was he was really improved last year, and that's one thing. 
Uh, I will say about him is that he really sh- showed out in that tournament. His match with Okabayashi was awesome uh, last year, and it felt like he was really getting it together for the first time in his career. And it's a shame that he's he's gone now at the timing of it all, but uh, hopefully these guys can land on their feet somewhere else. Definitely, definitely. And uh, the Champion Carnival will start on uh, April 6th at Corican Hall and uh, finish at Corican Hall on, on May 5th. I'm going to try to go to the uh, last two... Uh, shows. I'm going to try to get tickets for those. Those are both holidays. It's a Monday and a Tuesday. And uh, maybe, maybe I will appear on the Eastern Larry Patreon and, and do, do some five-hour shows with you there, Dylan. Yeah, that is true. Historically, your live show experiences have t- – and not just of the shows, too. You tell wonderful stories of the atmosphere of the shows and merchandise uh, dealings and all of that. But, uh, yes, uh, just a cheap plug right now on the Eastern Larry Patreon. I will be covering every single Champion Carnival show, uh, doing a podcast there, similar to the G1 we did last year. So uh, keep a lookout for that, and I can't wait for the tournament. I'm really excited about this lineup. Uh, there's a lot of great matches. And it should be able, it, when when you go, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, and may, maybe I will appear on some of these uh, shows for your Patreon. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to Big Japan Pro Wrestling, who are also having uh, their tournament. Uh, they're going to have the strong climb this year. This kind of like so. For those of you who don't know, Big Japan has two different prevalent styles of wrestling in their company. One is deathmatch wrestling, and one is you know quote unquote strong style wrestling. And and this and they alternate between having a deathmatch tournament and having a strong style tournament. And this year is the strong style tournament. So uh, they recently announced uh, their. Uh, their participants of the uh, the Strong Climb 2020 tournament and in four different blocks. So, do you have all the names in front of you, Dylan? Yes, yes, I do. Well, in fact, well, I, if, you, I mean, if, if you can do the honors, uh, give my voice a rest here. Tell us who is in from block A to block D here. That's right. A very unique style of tournament compared to the traditional Champion Carnival style with two blocks. This one has four. Uh, five men apiece, which I'm personally a big fan of. I actually like the multiple block setup. The more World Cup style uh, blocks here are a little bit better. In block A, we have Akira Hyodo, who's a young guy in uh, Big Japan, has a huge future, already won six man titles with uh, Daisuke Sakamoto and Takuo Kato, who's, uh, we'll get to him in a second. Uh, Ryuchi Kawakami, Daichi Hashimoto, and two outsiders, which are. Yoshiki Inamura from Noah and T Hawk from the Strong Hearts. Block B is Kazuki Hashimoto, Daisuke Sekimoto, Kohei Sato from Zero One, Taishi Takizawa from 2AW, formerly K Dojo. And this was just announced actually uh, a couple of days before we recorded this. Isami Kodaka from Basara is in Block B. Block C, Hideyoshi Kamitani, he's in the Champion Carnival. Ryota Hama, Yuji Okabayashi, Zero One's Yuji Hino, and Quiet Storm, fresh off his leaving Noah. Uh, he will be making an appearance in the Strong Climb Tournament. Block D, Yuya Aoki, Yasufumi Nakanoe, Takuya Nomura, Kazumi Kakuda, everyone's favorite uh, karate practitioner, and All Japan Pro Wrestling's Jake Lee making an appearance in, at Block D. So both Lee and Kamatani appearing in both the Champion Carnival and the Strong Climb Tournament. Well, we should we should say like there there's like a little bit of overlap with these tournaments, but it's not like they're going to be like you know like killing themselves doing both tournaments yeah. for the for the most part. Um, I gotta say like. Uh, I have no clear idea who's going to win this because, like, all Big Japan booking is let's let's be honest, it's shit. They 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 really have no fucking clue what they're doing because I I really think they think of the strong division as the side attraction and and death matches are their bread and butter, which you know it's fair. It's a it's a fair philosophy to take because it makes them a lot of money. For the most part, they do pretty well at Corkins. For the most part, it might be showing its teeth a little. But they, I think they really need to create a new deathmatch star in that company. But I gotta say, I'm most excited about Block B and Block D. Block C is my third favorite, and Block A is last on the list because mainly because Daichi's in it and he's fucking shit. I think Block A is like if, if he's the worst person in the tournament for sure. But the other four are all really strong, actually. Like I feel like in, in A Block. 
Uh, Hyodo is a really great young lion or young, you know, you know, young boy in Big Japan. Great young wrestler, and he's the natural successor to Sekimoto just by body type. <laughs> <laughs> like you can tell, looking at him right away, this guy is shaped just like Sekimoto. Where do they find these guys? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I was so, and I'm a huge fan of Inamura from Noah. Like that tag match on on last year's show that you went to in Sumo Hall, like was one of my favorite tag matches of the year, and he was the star of it, actually. T Hawk, I'm a big fan of Strong Hearts, and Kawakami, we talked about him earlier. So I think the parts where Daichi, yeah, he's not gonna, you know, go crazy or have great matches probably, but the other four I think are gonna have really strong tournaments. Uh, B Block is very consistent as well. I think I'm with you. That might be the best overall block, uh, considering it has Kodaka. Takizawa Sato. All those guys are good foreigners. And I'm a huge fan of Kazuki Hashimoto. I think he's one of the most underrated performers in any Japanese company. Um, in Big Japan, like you mentioned, the booking is totally goofy, <laughs> to be honest with you, and not not really good. So you have to look at that. C Block's probably. It's almost like, the, you know, Okabayashi's there, and he might be the best person in this whole tournament. Uh, he's got some really interesting matches. I don't know how that's going to play out, though, with Kamakani, Kamatani, Hino, Storm, Hama, you know, up and down mixed yeah. there. Like, there's potential, but not the greatest. The, the, I would the say. thing about Block C is that this is the, the Beefy Boys <laughs> block, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That's I, I think Ryota Hama's shit. Like, I don't care what anyone else know. thinks. The guy's shit. He yeah. sucks. Okay. Nice enough guy. He sucks. But. Like, it's going to be fun watching Quiet Storm try to chop the shit out of this guy and then Ryota Hama squash Quiet Storm because I think that's what's going to happen. And Yuki Okabayashi chopping the shit out of Ryota Hama and him getting squashed is also fun to watch. I, I will say this. Hama is, a, is fun to watch when he lands on people. And I, I'm going to love, like, him squashing Yuji Hino because, honestly, like, he's a good wrestler, but, man, I hate this guy. Like, he's such an asshole. Like, in real life. I'm talking <laughs> real life, like... Real talk, as you like to say, Dylan. Yuji Hino's a fucking asshole. Like, I, I do not like this man. Like, I can enjoy his matches, but I just think that guy's an asshole at the merch table. Let me tell you that, right? From personal experience. All right. And then Block D. And so it's good. I, I really like, you know, come on. We're going to get Jake Lee versus fucking Takuya Nomura. That's going to be fucking awesome, J- Dylan. It's going to be great. I'm, I'm looking forward to that match probably the most. Oh yeah, that's the best block in our uh, best match in Block D for sure. It's the other guys I'm not <laughs> as sold on in Block D. I mean, with all due respect to Kakuda, like you know, listen, him and uh, Kawakami actually had a decent little team uh, with the All Asian titles in All Japan. So he's got that All Japan lineage to him. Uh, Nakanoe, he's like really mid tier to me. Uh, he had a little bit of a run where he got super over. Uh, you know, he was like, remember when Yoshitatsu was like a young lion and he got like really popular in, in New Japan yes. before he left? Uh, that's kind of how like Nakanoe was. He had this uh, inexplicable popularity, but that has really gone all down the drain. Aoki's a good junior wrestler. And it'll be interesting to see his fit. Uh, the, I think C and D both have potential. They could go either way, but ultimately you're going to get Lee and Nomura. That's going to be a great match. Um, uh, we'll see what the rest do, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, like, and I have no idea who's going to win this. Do you have do you have any guesses who might win the Strong Climb tournament this year? Yeah, first of all, I have to say I'm very disappointed Taku Okato isn't in uh, the tournament, uh, Hiyoto's tag team partner, and also a like, fellow young guy. Uh, I think he's such a strong talent. He's like one of my favorite rookie wrestlers, along with Itamura. Like They should have put all three of those guys on a block and just let them all like do stuff to me. <laughs> like, that, that's what I, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like That would have been awesome. I, in my opinion, that's what I would have done if I booked uh, Big Japan. But you look at the, the way things go with the block system that they have. So they've really set it up to where anybody could win. History tells us that it will be one of Sekimoto or Okabayashi that wins this. Uh, but I could see someone like um, you know Kawakami. We always say like we've been waiting for his time over and over and over, and it never really comes. Uh, you know. And usually whenever Striga says something on my show, uh, my co-host, because he always tries to say, like, oh, Kawakami should be the next champion. I'm always like, that's never going to happen, <laughs> pretty much. And it never happens <laughs> at, at the moment. But I think a Kawakami or Nomura would be the ones to win, and I think Nomura is going to win this tournament. Uh, yeah, I think it's either Takuya or it's going to be Kawakami. I, I'm going to echo 
the sentiment there. So just quickly, uh, Strong Climb does start uh, next month, March 8th, and runs through the month of uh, March until it uh, wraps up. The semifinals will be... Uh, the semifinals and finals will be on April 12th. So a bit of, bit of overlap with the Champions Carnival, but nothing, nothing too strenuous for either Kamitani or Jake Lee. And, uh, something to keep an eye out, uh, if, <laughs> if these shows ever make broadcast, uh, BJW Core, their streaming service is notoriously, uh, bad at, uh, keeping, being updated. Uh, probably we're gonna have to wait for, uh, you know, Samurai Streams to, uh, appear, uh, in some fashion or form, uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that, Dylan. <laughs> well, I, I hope we can see it because they do have some good ta- uh, good talent in this tournament, some good matchups. Uh, really looking forward to a lot of the A and uh, B blocks, to be honest with you. Uh, everyone besides Daichi, I'm really looking forward to, uh, and I hope we get to see some of it, but you never know with Big Japan. Like I said, it's a very uh, interesting company. <laughs> Let's just say the say the least. Okay, and and final uh, story we wanted to talk about was uh, the purchase of Pro Signola by Cyber Agent, which is a media company that uh, currently owns uh, uh, DDT Pro Wrestling and, uh, and Tokyo uh, Joshi Pro Res as well. Uh, what else do they own? Do they own like Basara or something else? They, they broke off of the uh, DDT right, actually, okay. uh, boss. So, so yeah. it's just it's just DDT and TJPW then, and now no and Gambari and Gambari. Like I don't even don't forget about it. Well, what, <laughs> I don't even know what the fuck Gambari is like. I don't know the difference between that hard head fucking Basara oh, and like- fucking six six six. Like they're all fucking indies to me, and they're all probably sleazy <laughs> to some to one degree or another. Uh, first of all, I will not take this slander of hard hit uh, a shoot a shoot style themed company. Uh, the rest I don't care about. That they're all bad. But hard hit gives us good wrestling. Uh, Sato Hideki has been on there. It's a good show. They very rarely actually have shows, but when they do, they're usually good. The other ones, Gambari Pro, I don't care about at all. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll leave that alone. But yes, they're taking over the wrestling universe. Uh, Cyber Agent is now they own no. Okay, so here. I, this has been talked about. Jaws talked about this before on previous shows, and you've t- you've done a, a, a kind of a reaction show about this purchase. Uh, my my own thoughts are this: is that to me when I heard this, so Dylan, like I thought, okay, two things that came to mind: one, Cyber Agent is very serious about getting some of that, you know, that market share that Bushio pretty pretty much exclusively holds in the Japanese market, and the, the and related to that, the second thing is that they didn't they don't think that that uh, DDT is enough. They don't, they don't think that it's mainstream enough because you know, like you can like DDT. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan. I understand its popularity. I'm not here to, to slander it, but here's the thing. It is a very niche product. Uh, they, they do a lot of comedy and a lot of like, they have their, their set of fans that aren't necessarily fans of mainstream wrestling, which if you want to get some of that new Japan money, some of that new Japan market share, you're going to have to try to present a more mainstream product and to me they think noah has the potential to be a mainstream player in the world of pro res in terms of the marketplace and in terms of like really getting i think their streaming service more out there as well and what what are some of the thoughts that you had when you first heard the news dylan and you did a patreon of that but like for for the postmarks out there what 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 are your thoughts yeah, you know, I really agree with you, honestly. That was the first thing I thought, too. The second thing you said was that ultimately, if you want to be a mainstream company in Japan, uh, it's it's going to have to be either New Japan, NOAA, or All Japan. Those are the companies that have the cachet with the fans. That's what people think of when they think of wrestling on a mainstream level. With all due respect to DDT, it, it has nothing to do with being a fan or not. Uh, you just have to understand that that's never going to be a mainstream product you know it it is what it is there's nothing wrong with that uh because they do serve a fan base that's a lot different than the fan base that noah and new japan and all japan serve like they have their own fans and ddt has their own fans so it's really a lot different it's hard to that's why it's not even really an apples to apples comparison a lot of times because you you hear a lot of this stuff where you know other websites or things like that or other places that talk about japanese wrestling will say stuff like oh 
DDT is the number two company in Japan, but actually, like their fan base is so different that it's hard to even compare them. Like it's not even the same style of anything. Uh, Noah, like you said, that's where you get the mainstream stuff from. If you want to be a big company, want to be recognized, you had to have one of the three companies. Cyber Agent recognizes that. I'm sure they're happy with DDT. Uh, doing what it is but like i said even if they were happy with it they want to take a step forward and if they want to take a step forward it's by noah and that's what we saw here and and there's nothing wrong with that at all and the only thing that's uh negative about it from a fan perspective is that i think that it's kind of hard if you're a noah fan to take all these ownership changes as positive signs. Uh, even though I think this one actually is a positive sign. I think the other one was a positive side too. I think really every time they've changed hands and it, it's turned out to be an upgrade so far and we'll see how cyber agent does, but I think that, that they have a chance to do some things. I'm hopeful that to me, I said it on my, my, my other, my other show on the Patreon that I did the reaction show where they had the press conference. I'm so happy that they basically said that, Takagi has nothing to do with the wrestling side of things. Uh, it's more so Marfuji that's handling all of that. I think, to me, if I ran Cyber Agent and I'm looking at my wrestling division and saying, look, I want to have the mainstream company. Uh, I want to be up there with like Bushiroad is with New Japan. We have way – that's the thing. Cyber, a Cyber Agent is a way bigger company than Bushiroad as well. So you, you have to remember that. They actually have a lot more money behind them now. If I were involved, I would say, look, anybody that's worth a crap from DDT that could wrestle a mainstream style, not that you know these other guys don't have value to DDT fans, but for a Noah fan, a lot of the comedic guys are not going to be main events, main event level talents to say to say the least. If you want to be realistic about it, take the guys that can work from DDT, move them to Noah, like because to me DDT their style is the draw more so than any one person uh, outside of maybe to Teke- you know Takeshita I think you do have that you know as DDT champion uh, he's a little bit if you want to leave him there that's fine too but they have a lot of guys that kind of fly under the radar and aren't even as really pushed to DDT uh, th- because they just don't have they don't grasp the comedic style as well as they could so I think there's a there's a gold mine somewhat uh, guys like Keisuke Ishii that don't even get pushed to DDT, but is a really strong pro wrestler and would be a great benefit to Noah. And, you know, if you want to have a guy come on Peter Pan show from Noah, Mar Fuji or go has been a DDT a couple of times. That's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that. And we, we talked about this um, when we had our uh, conversation off air, uh, you know, if you're a Noah fan and you hear men, you know, whoever, Go Go is going to DDT. Well, he's a champion that right now. Maybe Nakajima is going to DDT. You may not like DDT, but at the end of the day, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, it, it's it's like when Kawada went to Hustle. It's like if you're a fan of his, like a true fan of Dangerous K, All Japan Kawada, you don't care what he did in, in Hustle, you know, if you were that type of serious fan. So it doesn't even matter. So I think there's no real downside unless they make mistakes in terms of how they run the companies and try to integrate too much of DDT into NOAA, which hasn't happened yet. And like I said, they were really, really pretty adamant that, that wasn't going to happen. But, you you, ne- you know, you never say never in wrestling, but I, I don't think that's what their plan was. Well, I think gonna they happen, have no- It's going to happen. It's not going to happen right away. It's eventually going to happen. Where they can't help themselves and they're just gonna no. do a joint show with like you know so and so versus oh, well, so and then you know DDT guys and you know Tika- here's the thing DDT is his baby like if it, if push comes to shove he's gonna put over his guys over the Noah dudes I, I truly believe that he's not huh like he, he's not running the wrestling side though like that, that's what they said at the press well, that's Mar-fuji. what they said right that's what they said but you know i, I it's a cynic in me dylan that's just coming out right now but you know you, know, find you, that it, you, know, you know who yeah. i would want to see like you know what they should do so ddt should send over higuchi right kasasada higuchi because that guy's perfect for for noah and in return for this one guy higuchi they should take the three members of the Rattels that that is not Daisuke Hirata, right. and send them over to DDT. And I will say this, objectively speaking, I really think that those three guys would fit a lot better with DDT. I think their characters would be a better match for DDT. And I'm not just saying this because I hate, you know, Tadasuke, Yohei, and Hayato. Uh, 
It's not because I hate them and I don't want to see them in no anymore, but that's part of it. But I do really think, genuinely, that they would fit a lot better in DDT. Well, they have more of a niche look to them, I, I, I would say for sure, like a DDT-esque look. Uh, you, obviously, a lot of these guys. Uh, Tadasuke came from Osaka Pro, which is a, another very comedically influenced promotion. And the other two were from Dove Pro, which is a crazy <laughs> indie promotion uh, pretty much as well. So they do have that. They they have the experience if they wanted to go to DDT. And I'm all for that because I'm, I'm not a huge fan. I think Tadasuke could be a good worker. Uh, his look is horrible. There, there's no question about that. But the other two are like very indie level talents to me, so I'm fine with that too. If they wanted, uh, take Kaguchi, take Ish- Ishii. Uh, to me, like I said, if it were me, anybody that was good, I would move to Noah. <laughs> like, like for real. Like to catch that would be gone. All of them. <laughs> like, like they'd all go to Noah. Uh, help the depth of the company because last year they had a ten man tournament for you know their biggest tournament of the year their in one victory now you could have a 20 man tournament <laughs> like with the the good DDT guys you can get 5 to 10 guys that would fit the Noah style i feel like uh, pretty easily actually and build a deep company that can outshine a lot of these other ones that they're competing with i feel like but th- that might not happen but still you know like i said the main thing is just to keep everything intact and put the money into it put the advertising into it Maybe get some more green into their logo, <laughs> like bring that back, you know, all that stuff. Well, you, you bring much. up a good point, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up on this point. Like, you know, Ledette, during their ownership, really changed the aesthetics. It was really, truly a, a battle of aesthetics with their ownership, <laughs> yes. like where they kind of started shifting away from the Masao era. They got rid of the green mat. They replaced it with a white mat. They, you know, they, they, they changed the logo, which I'm not, I'm not, against because i i do like the logo i think it gave them a really good fresh paint uh coat of paint right um i i just want to know like i feel that there might be a possibility that cyber agent is gonna maybe halt the kind of new japanification process of of noah like you know calling their their global league the n1 tournament calling you know creating this national title that's supposed to be like the IC title and the US title are, you know, kind of a mix of those two having like this, you know, like, and changing the, the, the GHC heavyweight title to look very much like the current incarnation of the IWGP heavyweight title. Like, I wonder if that's going to continue or if they're just going to kind of just stop it right there. Cause I got to say, I'm not, as, as a Noah fan, as someone who was a Noah fan for from its inception, and like I've lapsed here and there, but I don't want it to be a clone of New Japan Pro Wrestling aesthetically. You know, like I want it to kind of stand on its own with its branding and with the titles and the names of its tournaments and things like that. So I'm I'm kind of hoping Cyber Agents is going to kind of just not necessarily revert back to anything, but just maybe that's it. Just keep it at that, and and no more. Like trying to copy New Japan. You know, when Ledette first came in and changed the logo, at first I think my reaction was similar to a lot of people in that I hated that. <laughs> like, you know, I was like, it was so goofy and their reasoning of it made no sense. I remember listening to your show with John and John brought up a great point. It was like changing the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, you know, because they had too much of a legacy. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's actually a positive. Uh, not a negative, and they shouldn't have changed it. The changes they actually made, though, at first, I really liked a lot of them because they actually signified the exact opposite of what New Japan was doing because, in my opinion, New Japan has gone through a lot more of a uh, really Americanization of their style of wrestling and everything about them pretty much. Uh, And a lot of Noah's early aesthetics were very Japanese influenced. You look at the logo, it has the red uh, circle in it. You have the, the early poster they had, which is a great poster with Kiyomiya doing the, the tiger suplex. Uh, it had very much like an old school Japanese feel to it. And then you, they do stuff with the N1. They change the title around. And I was like, Ugh. <laughs> you know, like that. I wasn't into that at all. Like N1, that, that was not good at all. And I agree with you completely that – Hopefully, Cyber Agent uh, reverts the, reverts it back to the Global League. Uh, it's too late for the title now, but you know it's a nice title for what it is. Even if it looks too similar to the uh, IWGP title, it still looks nice. Uh, you know, so that's okay. Change the N one. Get back to like you said, 
And NOAA, to me, historically has been pretty much my favorite company uh, through a lot of years. And I think that if they continue to be like New Japan, that's not a good look. They don't want to go in that direction. Uh, try to get back their own identity, which I think they were doing a great job of at one point, even last year, really. So I don't think it's an impossible test by any means. But, yeah, that's something they need to, to work on. Try to keep their own unique identity that they're, that they're going to need to take on New Japan. Well, with that being said, uh, let's wrap it up here. Uh, we got we got a lot of stuff in here, and I and I really want to thank you for taking the time out, Dylan, to to join me on here, especially with the uh, you know un, uh, unforeseen uh, you know mishap with John being able to uh, not being able to do the show with us. Uh, but he'll be back uh, next month for for the March show. And uh, any any final plugs? Where can more people find Dylan Fox on uh, talking about wrestling? First of all, I'd like to thank you for having me on, WH. Uh, like I said, we've had you on our show uh, multiple times at this point and had a lot of fun with, with you on the show. Uh, hopefully the listeners enjoyed uh, us talking again like that right now. You know, I really enjoy it. And, John, I miss you, man. I, I hope one day we can get together and do it again. But uh, nothing but love and respect to you and Way as well, everyone on Post Wrestling in general. I'm a huge fan. I'm a subscriber myself. So I, I always listen to your shows. You're a post shows for New Japan as well. I'd love to have you on, John. Or I'd love to be on your show, John. And I'd love to have you on. You're welcome to come on my show too if you ever listen. But if you want to find me online, the main place you can find me is on Twitter at Dylan Zero Sky, D Y L A N, the word zero, Z E R O, Sky, and also the Eastern Lariat, obviously, my main podcast. And on that show, I host it with Striga, my man from cagematch.net. He's the big boss of that sh- of that website, something that everyone uses in wrestling pretty much in one way or the other. Uh, we talk about all kinds of wrestling on there, always Japanese for the main show. Uh, I have a, si- a spinoff show, Pure Heart, Pure Lariat, which I'm coming out with a new episode uh, uh, in the next week or two, uh, all about Joshi Pro Res, which I'm a big fan of, obviously, as well. We have the Patreon, patreon.com slash Eastern Lariat, all about wrestling in many forms. Uh, Japanese wrestling. Sometimes I'll do shows like a big WWE shows on, a big AEW shows on. Uh, talk about past wrestling from the 90s. I have my 90s project. I just released a new episode of that uh, talking about all kinds of wrestling uh, from 1992. I do it f- top 50 matches every year. And then the, the awards, Wrestling Observer Newsletter style of that. I've done two years already. And my good friend Fredo Esparza is going to be on from Lucha World and Retro Wrestling, uh, the top 10 show for that. So lots of good stuff. Talk about Tiger Mask W, an anime podcast is on there about wrestling. Uh, we got all kinds of cool stuff on there. Me and Striga are going to be doing something, uh, too. We just did a show about all Japan's recent show. Anytime there's a big show in Japanese wrestling, we pretty much got you covered no matter what company it's for. So highly recommend that. Uh, only 5 bucks, you get everything. Uh, $3, you get the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, foreign wrestling stuff and one dollar is ma- ba- mainly for support but any of my written content is on there as well uh, i just introduced a new feature last month about uh, best of the month and if there's any uh, you know live reaction show we put them there too so one three five dollar chodo muto and big hosh tears and that's what you can all sign up there so please check it out if you enjoyed the show and check out our show and enjoy that as well yeah and uh anytime yours truly shows up on the eastern layer of patreon that's always a that's always a big hash level, right? I'm I'm big hash level. Yeah. That's right. You are exclusively big hash tier for sure, WH. You you know I I love having you on for all of those shows. You bring a lot of great insight. Uh, you know you've been on multiple shows. We did the live reaction show when you were live at the Big Japan show and the Noah show. Uh, we did a couple of Joshi shows, Pure Heart, Pure Lariat. You were on both free and Patreon. Um. You know, we uh, like I said, even on the free show, you've been on a few times. So I really, really appreciate that. But when, on the Patreon, for sure, anytime this guy's on, it's definitely you. You want to sign up for the five dollar tier. That's what you want to sign up for anyway. I'm not just putting myself over, but that's where you get a lot of the coolest stuff. Uh, the '90s projects, like my my baby, practically uh, podcast. I love seeing that old school wrestling. And whenever WH is on, it's a, a a bona fide hoot. Yeah, we gotta. I gotta get on that '90s project. Like when you get like a run of Steiner brothers matches you, you 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 call me up and like i'll i I'll, I'll love to talk about ni- 1990s era you know standard brothers and uh maybe we'll make that happen one day dylan but uh thanks again follow dylan 
on Twitter. Follow Dylan's uh, and Striga's Patreon, the Eastern Lariat. Check that out. It's great stuff. If you like what you hear here, you're going to hear a lot more of it. Uh, covering a lot of, like, tons of older stuff as well. If you're a big fan of Cruel Summer and Thunderstruck, definitely check out Dylan's 90s project. Uh, for, for John Pollock, who's not here today, but it's okay. He'll be, he'll be back next uh, month. For, for Dylan, my name's WH Park. You can follow me at WH Park 9 on Twitter. And until the next show, I will say to everyone, goodbye.